We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, the question I'm asking the bellhop is, I know you spent a big part of this past weekend checking out all the new games announced during Gen Con Spring Spectacular. Out of all those games, what were you most excited about? All right, that's right. I did spend a number of hours on the weekend watching Gen Con TV uh, on Twitch, on their Gen Con TV Twitch channel, and all of the presentations from various publishers and board game media showcasing current and upcoming releases, as well as a few games that were released last year that really didn't get the hype they deserved due to the lack of a regular con scene. That's right, folks. Unlike our usual game discussions, this week we are actually all about the new hotness. I am going to pause for one quick second. Yes, I, in the notes, wrote Gen Con Spring Spectacular everywhere, but it's actually the Gen Con Spring Showcase. Ah. But just as saying it out loud, I'm like, that doesn't sound right. So quick correction there before we get too deep into things. And I do apologize because I am working off some notes here. If I put spectacular again, it is supposed to be showcase, the Gen Con Spring Showcase. So before I get into the games I saw, I want to let everyone know what the Gen Con Spring Showcase is. Uh, This is a brand new online event that just started this year. But this is something that Gen Con plans to become a regular thing this is something they're going to do every year in march and the goal is to let publishers showcase the new games coming out later that year now i have a strong unconfirmed feeling that the actual goal of this is to highlight the games that will be released at gen con the physical game convention later in the year like for gen con this is a great way to get buzz going not only for the games and the publishers, but for the con, right? Like you saw it on the Gen Con showcase. Now come to Gen Con and pick it up for yourself or do a demo or try the game. That's thoughts. I don't know if that's true. My feeling is that this year, due to the fact we don't even know there will be a physical Gen Con, it became more of a event mainly for publishers, right? For them to highlight their new hotness, whether it's releasing at Gen Con or not, or just came out this year. And it'll be interesting to me to see what ch- if this changes, right? Assuming next year everything's back to normal, please, that if there's a regular Gen Con, if this really just becomes like the Gen Con hype show, which I really think it could be. Well, don't feel bad if you missed it. Most people did, which is why we're covering it here. We <laughs> almost missed it ourselves. All right, so what exactly was the Gen Con Spring Showcase? Now, while I called it a gaming con, and I guess that's what it is, really, because there were games and there were demos going on and stuff, but it was really more of a media event. Like, there was a webpage uh, that had a product spotlight section that showed off every single game that was mentioned, how you can pre-order it, and how you can find more information with lots of pictures. And it was neat because the way this started is there was nothing on this page if you logged in Saturday when the con started. It was after every Twitch stream ended, someone was going in there and putting in the update. So that way it wasn't spoiling anything because there were a number of games announced for the first time during this con. So it was kind of cool to watch that section of the web page grow. And I got to say, it was invaluable to me to go back to to remember some of the games that were talked about before I realized, hey, I want to take notes on this because I think this would be a cool podcast topic. Now, the live streams are what I actually took part in. Um, Each live stream was 50 minutes long. They were a mix of publishers showing off their games. So you would have like a a rep from Pandasaurus or Renegade Games there or board game media doing things um, like actual plays. There was a group called Hyper RPG that did a bunch of live unboxings on stream. Um, There were just some media folks just talking about the games they're excited about and what they're hyped about. Now, along with all this, there was the usual Discord server, which has, as of about March last year, I'm not sure when the first one was. Renegade Con is the first one I attended, but uh, Discord-based social gatherings at online conventions is definitely a thing now. Every online client has greatly taken advantage of the use of Discord. And there was one of these for this. Um, at, in the Discord, you could actually demo a number of the games. Uh, they were all on Tabletopia, from what I understand. 
um, which is free to use. So if you were there, you could go into a demo room and you could sign up and actually try a number of these games. Plus it was Discord, so it was a chat room. So it was a place to hook up with other gamers and hang out and talk and talk about the games you like and so on. The flexibility and ease of setup and teardown of Discord servers, as well as an evolving but powerful permission system, really makes Discord, for all of its flaws, a great platform for this kind of uh, event. Yeah, my only problem with Discord is I'm on so many servers and there's no way to keep up. And I would have a real hard time if I did have Discord open to remember to just stay in the Gen Con spot. That's, that's the only disadvantage I find with Gen Con. And especially with the, it's ending up that there have been multiples of these cons on the same weekends. I don't know if there was anything but Gen Con this weekend, but trying to keep track of everything becomes overwhelming. And I think all you have to do is put yourself in the headspace that you're at a con and manage your time appropriately. Like, I am going to go spend an hour on the Discord and see what people are saying about this game I'm curious about. And then I'm going to go to a panel, a, a Twitch channel, and watch that and close the other window. All right, based on the overall farm format and the way it worked, uh, like I say, in the last year, companies have really nailed down this online con format, and it was working great. Like, the, the Twitch stream was flawless, except for, like, one person had an audio issue, and they were doing great things with transitions to switch from showcasing the people talking to showcasing pictures of the board games and video showing the components. Like, it was just much better produced than any of the other online cons I've seen. And I, I'm certain this will happen again next year, Wh whether there's a Gen Con or not, a physical Gen Con. I think this was a great way to drum up buzz about the new hotness. And to be honest, look, like we're the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. We are almost never about the new hotness. And here we are talking about it. So I, it must have worked somewhat, right? Yep. So sit back and enjoy a brief and rare foray into <laughs> hot new games. All right. So just quick. Before I get to the actual games, just overall, I had a good time. Um, it was a, a pleasant experience. I got to learn about all kinds of stuff. But what I really appreciated the most was the fact that most of the streams were excellent uh, with interacting with the chat. And that's not something you would get at a panel, at a con. Like, they may have a Q&A period at the end. But even more so, like, the kind of announcements we were talking about here is more like attending a keynote. And keynotes aren't really interactive. It's you sit back and hear about the new stuff. And I think this was really cool because you got to ask questions about these games. Like, hey, what age group? Or you said that it's this, this, and this, but what happens in a tie? And what do you do if you're doing this? Like one of the games that was showcased, they played the cooperative mode. So I had all kinds of questions about the competitive mode, which they weren't talking about. They were playing the cooperative and they mentioned it competitively. And I'm like, I think I'd rather play this competitively. Can you tell me more? And I was getting, in, well, near instant feedback, as much as instant feedback as you get on Twitch, which was awesome. All right, well, enough about what the Gen Con Spring Showcase is. We want to know what games you learned about that got you excited. Now, this list is in the order they were presented over the weekend and aren't mm. ranked in any way. Also, this is only a small sampling of the games that were showcased this weekend. For a full list, head over to www.genconspringshowcase.com. In addition, you can head to the Gen Con official YouTube channel where they have VOD versions of every single one of the panels from the weekend. Yeah, I actually really appreciate that last part because I found out about the event a little late, so I missed a few, and I was able to watch them after the fact, so that was cool. All right, so I'm going to start off with a new series of games coming from Haba. Now, when I say Haba, everyone thinks Yellow Box Kids games. No, these are from their, their Game Night Games series, which we've highlighted a few on the show, like um, Roll For It is one of them. Or no, not Roll For It, the King one. Oh, I forget the name of it. That's terrible. Wow, I am drawing a complete blank. I can picture it. And it's a dice rolling game that's similar to Roll For It, and it's fantasy themed. Oh, I'm terrible. I'm sorry, Hobby. No, no, no. <laughs> this, is, like, this is dice, what is the I name know. of that game. I have no idea. King of the Dice. That was without actually Googling. King of the Dice. My bad for totally blanking out on the name of that game. Adventureland is a much more well known Hobby game that's in that series. So, anyway, this new game is um, cashing in on the, the, the whole escape room puzzle deduction style games. And it's called The Key is the series. And there's three games in the Key series. Uh, the one that they did a live play of 
um, it was um, Raul Aviola and his wife who played it. Um, they were playing a game called The Key, Sabotage at Lucky Llama Land. So this is a theme park themed game where some kind of crime has been committed. All these games are trying to solve a crime. Um, the first two games are more family friendly. Uh, there's this one. I can't remember what the second one was. The third one that's not out yet actually is solving a murder. So that one's more for adults. This one's definitely more kid friendly. And you are at a theme park called Lucky Llama Land with all rides themed after llamas. Three hooligans have sabotaged three of the rides at the theme park. Now, this happened over three days, and each of the hooligans used a different set of tools. And you need to use the clues provided in the game to figure out who sabotaged what ride on what day with what tool. And there are nine different possible cases to solve in this. But because of the way the clue system works, you could actually replay this. There's no reason, like, solving one doesn't mean that it's going to be the same every time. So it, but you may, if you remember the final number, you're going to get the same answer. But how you get to that answer would be different. So I don't know. That was one of the things I questioned them while playing is how replayable is it? And they were really pushing that, yeah, it's, it's a replayable. I don't know. That's, that's one I'd have to try. So this game is a mess. You put a key in the middle of the table, and then you scatter the cards over your whole table, using up as much space as you can so that people can see as many cards as once. Each of these cards is a clue to how to solve it. And they have a grid of colors on the back that shows which of the nine cases they apply to. Now, they actually tell you to keep all the cards on the table, even if there's clues that don't apply to your case, because part of this game is a race to solve it first. And if people grab the wrong clues, it can send them on a wild goose chase. So when you grab a clue, you're going to flip it over and it's going to tell you some information. There's all kinds of different things here. So one of the coolest ones I like is with the game, you get a map of Lucky Llama Land. But man, did I get Bob Lowe flashbacks looking at this map. Like it looks like that 1980s hand-drawn cartoony yep. theme park map. And what the selfies do is the person holding the weapon, of course, had to take a picture. Of, of some other people so you know what ride they're at but you have to deduce it by looking at the selfie they've got to see where they were standing in the park so you sit there and you look at it and you're like oh there's a roller coaster in the background and i can see the drop ride so they must have been standing over here by the log ride which i thought that was kind of neat i've never seen that in a deduction game before um there's also eyewitness reports that are just basically give you some kind of information like oh i saw this person on this day another one i thought was brilliant was ticket sale records. So you could figure out what tickets one of the people bought. And then by putting together what tickets they bought, you can figure out what day they were at the park. Because And then with that, there was another one that had info on the maintenance schedule for the rides. So at certain points, certain rides were closed. So again, you'd use deduction to go, well, she was on the park at Thursday and she went on this and this, and she had tickets for this and this ride and this ride was closed. So therefore it's gotta be this person. Now, the neat part about all this is the base game is competitive. Everyone is trying to solve the mystery at once. And you're grabbing these cards off the table that are spread everywhere. You're looking at the clue and you're using your own little personal thing and a dry erase marker to circle who you think it is. And then eventually you're like, I got it. And then you do this thing where there's a two-sided board and you stick the key in it. You don't actually turn it. And then you flip it over. And if the keys this matches the color of the tag, you've got the right person. Or you can play the entire game cooperatively where you're all working together to solve it. And you get a score based on the numbers that are on the clues based on how good or bad they are. I just, it was a really neat, different take on deduction. Like nothing, like I was kind of blown away the same way I was blown away by Chronicles of Crime 1400 by doing something completely different. And this did that. My concern though, is that replayability. I, though nine cases is a lot, like nine plays out of a modern board game nowadays, who plays their games nine times, except for those, big hits I, I gotta say nine plays isn't bad uh what i didn't know here is what the msrp is but i remember thinking it was very reasonable 29.99 msrp for nine plays yeah a minimum of a game that's got a lot of components the components look at least reasonably solid the yep. art is very friendly mm -hmm. and uh from what i from a quick glance i can't i can't tell for sure but it seems very open and inclusive uh in the artwork yep. And you know what? I think that's probably a good deal. Right now, uh, the key sabotage of Lucky Llama Land is uh, available, and the other one that is currently available 
is uh, uh, Murder at the Oakdale Club is the other one. See, that's that one's not right supposed now. to be released yet. That should be a, oh, is a it pre-order. pre-order maybe? That, uh, that's probably, they nope. said the murder one wasn't out yet. Right now okay, there were two family friendly ones. It's, it's, show, it's showing available on their website. So Well, maybe <laughs> they meant later, like five days, three days Possibly. from now. <laughs> which is possible um, but but yeah so oh deanna's saying it's out in europe but not over here oh i'm a, I'm so, a habit usa.com and it says and it says uh, add to cart so i don't know I, it is it is highly possible um yeah. that it wasn't available on saturday but it is now because i was seeing that during the whole con to be honest could be i'm i'm also concerned uh, I mean, I, I think I love logic puzzles, always have as a kid. So I think that that's a fun aspect and a, and yep. a more interesting aspect than some of the um, less strictly logic puzzle based uh, yeah. mystery games. Uh, but also llamas. What is with llamas? There, I mean, I, you get llamas in everything these days. No, that, that's know. the new pirates, the new zombies, yeah, the I new guess. Mars. Well, that was <laughs> that was the key. Some sabotage at Lucky Llama Land. All right, next up, I have a game from The Op. Uh, we feature them many times on our blog and site and podcast. And the game is The Batman Who Laughs Rising. And I got to say, when I first saw this game online, I thought it was The Batman Who Laughs Rising. And I didn't get it. But I guess it's The Batman Who Laughs, which is some super dark DC comic run from the DC Metal Universe where the Joker becomes the Batman. Sorry, the Batman who laughs, which fits, I guess. Um, so it's the Batman who laughs rising. Now, this is a follow up to the rest of the rising series. Uh, Thanos rising and Voldemort rising or Dark Eaters rising. I can't remember what that one's called. Death There's Eaters a number rising, of yeah. these rising games. And I got to admit, I've never played any of them myself. They, ne- they never really caught my interest from what I understand. They're fairly light. But watching the Hyper RPG team unbox this game, I got to say I'm tempted to pick it up just by the look of this game like you have this batman who laughs statue that would just look great on the game shelf back here like as a display piece it just looked really cool and then the components are really neat uh they have some of the most detailed engraved custom dice i've seen like these are really engraved like not not just the it's it's the opposite it's the the logos are standing up and everything around them is engraved instead mm-hmm. of just etching in the letters and numbers and stuff. And they're dice with all the DC logo, DC logo, right? They got Wonder Woman die with the Wonder Woman logo and a Green Lantern die with the Green Lantern symbol and the super soup symbol and all that. I, it just looks really cool. Now, I got to admit, I don't know enough about these games. So this is one I'm definitely looking forward to hearing more reviews about and consider picking up sometime in the future. I'm, I'm just, I couldn't believe how good this game looked. I'm like, man, that is a, it's just table presence. Looks sweet. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we should note that this is, this game is listed for 15 plus. Yeah. It is dark material. This is not your, you know, little kids Batman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, whoever thought punctuation on Batman would be important. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I have to question how long they can keep pumping out these rising games. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a re-implementation of Thanos rising, which, and they've already had, you know, the Harry Potter re-implementation of Thanos rising. At some point, mm-hmm. the people who are interested in the rising game are going to have at least one copy already. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, you, you know what? That Some of these series just uh, take off and keep going, right? The, how many villainous games there are now like there's a whole ton of villainous disney they just released a new Disney. but isn't villainous, villainous all one game just different villains? <clears throat> no because now they've released marvel villainous oh okay i thought, see, I thought it, was all, it was one game and, oh no there's oh, it's it's okay. similar they've and this is not the op this is a different company doing it no, or another example is the um dominion right like you just but like you said dominion is all one game there aren't other versions of dominion but then there's clank and clank in space like it's not uncommon to see this and like to be honest one of the games that wasn't on my list to talk about was another rising game (laughs) and that's the one they did the actual play so they they unboxed the batman who laughs rising but they played a spongebob rising game called plankton rising which I Plankton, I guess, is the villain in SpongeBob. I don't know. Sure. And they were doing things to like build burgers, and if they failed at building their burgers on time, uh, people were getting upset. I don't know. I, I 
it wasn't something I was interested in, but I got to say the people on the stream seemed to really dig it. They they were laughing their butts off. So well, you know, SpongeBob fans will SpongeBob, <laughs> and that was Bat the Batman Who Laughs Rising. That's still weird. The Batman Who Laughs. I don't know, because I, I did, was trying. To, I'm I like, what does Who Laughs Rising mean? All right. Also from the op USA Opoly, I want to talk a bit about Hughes and Hughes. This is such a simple concept that I've already had some buzz about. Like, I, I already thought it sounded pretty cool, but I actually got to see it in action, and it worked so well. This is a color-based game where one player gets a card with four colors on it, and they pick one that's going to be their target for this game. Then they give a one-word clue, one word only. So think, uh, like, uh, code names. And then the board is a huge grid showing the entire color spectrum. Now, the other players are going to put a token on the spot they think that matches the clue. So if you say apple, you're probably going to put it somewhere red. Or maybe not. Maybe you put it on yellow because you were thinking Mutsu or something. But that's why apple is probably not the best clue. <laughs> but then the clue giver can give out a two-word clue. And they get to place a second token. So maybe you said apple the first time. They're like, oh, yeah, I never thought of Mutsu. So I am going to say Macintosh tree and then people are like oh okay but then someone's thinking tree and they put it on brown wherever they place their things the player who gave out the clue puts this box out around the right number and based on where the pawns are in relation to that box players are going to score points and they have to be close they have to be like inside it on the inside edge or on the outside edge to score points otherwise it's not worth anything this is just what a brilliant design. Like, it's just so smart. I'm like, wow, that is just such a cool concept for a game. This is one I'm going to be contacting my contact at the op to see if we can get a copy of. Well, you know what? I'm interested in this one just to see if my color theory knowledge from <laughs> art and photography ever actually sank in. Uh, I would actually love to see Pantone jump in with a branded mm. version of this, which would be a blast for graphic designers to play. And I'm sure they would be all over it. My only concern, like you being able to play it, the problem is you'd need other people with the same level of experience for that to actually work. Possibly. Although it could just be, a, you know, one person has the advantage of being able to give better clues or, or get clues better. Yeah. You know, I'd be interesting to see, though. That's, that's it would. part of it. Interesting. And that was Hughes and Cues from the Op. All right. The next one I've got is something I had no clue about whatsoever. Um, this is Epic Encounters from a company called Steam Forge Games, who do a lot of RPG work. Uh, this is a box set that's basically a D&D 5th edition encounter in a box that features 20 miniatures that, wow, like these, these are minis, like, like, like maxis in a way. Like these are nice. These are really nice. They don't look they have a unique style, a unique flair to them. I think there's a little bit of an anime aspect to some of these. Uh, note this company actually does have the license to do the Monster Hunter game. So that was another one they showcased, but not one I was going to highlight here. So I don't know. These, these really kick butt looking miniatures. And you get 20 of them. You get a two-sided battle mat. And then you get an adventure. And the adventure is set so that like one of the questions that got asked and the, one of the newest adventures is a Hydra based one. And they're like, well, Hydra, you're not going to put a first level party up against a Hydra. And they're like, but wait, we have it set up. So that this is set up for three tiers of play and you can play a level five or a level 15 or a level 30. I'm making these numbers up, whatever they happen to be, but they're the heroic exploration or Epic level of play. And there's a counters that use the miniatures designed for all of them. And they pointed out that in the Hydra at the low level play, you're going to see the Hydra. It's good. You're going to get to put the mini out and scare the heck out of the players. But then it's going to back off while its minions rush forward to stop the heroes as it escapes so that they can face it later, which is actually a really good adventure design. And I, I got to say, these are 50 bucks each. $50 for 20 great looking miniatures and a flip mat is a good deal to me. As someone who likes to play D&D with maps and minis, that's a good price. And to me, the adventure's a bonus. Like, hey, you also give me three adventures to run with these things. And now, how many different Epic Adventures are there? Because I know Epic Adventures isn't, you, you can't buy Epic Adventures. You could buy Epic Adventures, the Hydra, or Epic Adventures, yeah. the Kobold, Kobolds. 
I think there were three out and they just announced two more. I'd, okay. I'd have to look it up. So what these are is these are actually a third party product for fifth edition D&D. This is not a standalone thing. You are not getting to play Epic Adventures. You are buying Epic Adventures for your D&D game using that terminology. So this is not like a, a box set that you'll be able to use on your own. Now, of course, you could buy it and paint the miniatures up and use them for wherever and use the maps, but there is no Epic Adventures game. These are supplements for the world's most popular role-playing game, I think is the proper way to word it nowadays instead of using its brand name. And that was Epic Encounters from Steamforge Games. All right, next I've got a game from Calliope Games. Now, this is one and that is back in print. So it's ship shape. It came out and blew up. The, the podcasters I listen to love this. And it went out of stock quick. Like Calliope definitely grossly underestimated the popularity of this game. So this was a case where Calliope was on this Gen Con showcase, not promoting a new game, but rather promoting a reprint, saying, hey, everyone, Ship Shape's back in stock. Now, I got to say, I when I first heard about this game, it sounded cool. And I got to watch an actual play. Now, this was on Tabletopia, so I didn't get to see the actual components, but it was a really well done simulation on Tabletopia. So it looked really good. So what you've got is uh, it's, it's a drafting game. You all have ships, pirate ships, ship holds. And there's a hold there with a three by three grid on it. And everyone's starting ship is going to have three rats on it. And those are negative points if you still got them in your hold by the end of the game. Now, each round you're bidding to draft hold tiles, which are in a stack in the center of the tile table. Now, these are also a three by three grid, but like they're, it has holes. I don't know how to describe it with hold, holding one up and I don't have one here, but it, it's, it's a three by three grid with lots of holes in it that are only covering parts of that. And if you look at the stack from above, you can see stuff below, right? Like you, you, you don't just see the top style. You can kind of see what's in the next couple of cards. And like, you might even see all the way down to the bottom and be like, wow, there's nothing in the top left corner. So you're bidding. And part of the strategy here is trying to figure out, do you want to go first to get the top card? Or maybe you actually want the third card because you can see it has the right thing on it. Now, these all feature gold cannons and or contraband. And what you're going to do is you bid your bid, then you're going to get your thing, and then you get to place it on your hold, on your shipboard. And you can flip it, rotate it, turn it, literally any way, and it's two-sided. So you've got any possible orientation. And you're going to try to put it on your ship and then draft more and put that on your ship and put that on your ship. And eventually you get your completed hole where you look down at your ship and see what you can get. Now, you hopefully have covered up all your rats. Uh, you just get straight-up points for the amount of gold you have. Now, cannons don't score points, but the person with the lowest is penalized. If I remember, they, their gold doesn't count or something like that. And then if I remember correctly, again, I, I was watching a bunch of live streams. Contraband is one of those who has the most contraband gets something and who has the least might get punished. So it sounds super simple and it really is, but there's more to it than that. And the part that I didn't know about this game that makes me much more interested in picking it up is that the tiles you draft have that thing where you can see through and every tile adds up to eight on those three things. So if you see a tile with eight gold showing, you know, there's nothing else on the top. Whereas if you see a tile with three gold, you know, there's five more cannons or five more contraband or a combination of the boat. And I think that really adds a level of strategy to what sounds like a really basic game. This looks like one of those games that's dead simple to teach, right? Like here draft, you're going to place a place on your thing. But then you're going to have those aha moments where you're like, oh, wait, but I want to do this. Oh, wait. And, and then I want to watch their hold to see, oh, they're collecting cannons. Like, it just seems like one of those simple to learn, hard to master games, which is always a winning combination. Now, I'm guessing we got to be careful. It's not the Romper Room, my first game version of Ship Shape, which is two words, Ship Shape. The game okay. you're looking for if you're popping onto board, to board Game Geek is Ship Shape, one word. Okay. <laughs> Very different games there. Uh, see, I see this one's sort of interesting to me, but again, I'm not a huge bluffing fan, and and there is that aspect of it to this game. So I, you know, I definitely have to to try before buying on this one for me. But that is Ship Shape from Calliope Games. All right, up next, I got another Calliope game, one that I had no idea was coming from one of the biggest names in board gaming. This is a tile-laying game called Ancestry. 
this is from Eric Lang, like uh, the 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 man behind uh, Blood Rage and and uh, <laughs> Rising Sun, right? Like you don't think of a light tile laying game as being an Eric Lang game nowadays. That name alone made me pay attention. I gotta say, I'm like, holy cow, this is it, it looks really sweet. So this is a filler twenty minute tile drafting game where you're drafting members of a family and there's all kinds again very diverse artwork showing different people and on them there are possible connections above and below them and you're going to draft the tile and you're going to put it down and then you're building either a lineage by placing things in a row going down or you can place the tile side by side assuming the right connectors there to create a marriage there's scoring every round to see who has the longest lineage in each of the different families, which are represented by player colors, as well as symbology to help with any color blindness issues. There's also a Fibonacci based endgame scoring for marriages. So like one marriage is worth one, two marriages is worth three, uh, four marriages is worth seven, you know, Fibonacci series where you add the previous number to the one you already had. So there's that aspect of it. Um, you play through three rounds and every round you're going to score those lineages. So it's one of those, you might only get a couple points the first round, but by the third, you hopefully have all these lineages. There's also an aspect of who has the most of each color. A lot of interesting things going on. Uh, artwork by Larry Elmore, who any Dungeons and Dragons fan, fantasy fan should know that name. Uh, just really neat looking filler game. Now, this one is interesting. This actually does look like my style of fun filler. Um, it's it's very... Um... Seven Wonders esque almost, uh, with the yeah. with the pass and uh, pass drafting uh, set up and you're you know laying down in front of you. Uh, interestingly, this isn't a new game though. See, they didn't even have physical copies. This game. So is, is it a reprint? This I I don't know, but this game is from 2017, and there are reviews going all the way back to 2017 available on Board Game Geek. So was it published in Europe? Well, it's well, the first I'm time in North America. Well, I'm interested in it. I'm. Uh, not quite sure what I mean. I've got United States reviews from 2017, so Weird. maybe th maybe this is a reprint or something. But uh, somehow this isn't actually anywhere near as new as some of the things that we. Uh, yeah, that's odd. I wonder. I wonder. I why didn't. They... I didn't even notice this the first time when I was when I was checking for no on the notes. But uh, I there's almost no pictures too, which is really weird. Yeah, but I mean, like, it's, it's like got a number now, of reviews, but not that many really for heck it was a 2018 mensa recommended game yeah <laughs> there is an official english page which does make me think that maybe it was uh and i do see english edition mentioned a couple times right. so it must have been in another language but yeah <laughs> like the dice tower reviewed this three years ago yeah all right see i, I lied i said <laughs> we're going to be all about the new hotness and it ends up that the spring spectacular it's, tricked yeah. me <laughs> it made me think these are the new hotness, but they're actually not. But that was Ancestry <laughs> from Calliope Games. All right, fair enough. All right, these ones are supposedly brand new and hot. All right, I, I promise you on this one. Uh, the next uh, panel I attended was the IGDN panel, which is the Indie Game Developers Network. Um, I don't have a lot to say about specific games here. They showcased a bunch of great looking indie RPGs. Uh, Aloy, uh, third. Third Eye Games put out a new part-time gods expansion, which I was just cool to see that system still running. Uh, that's an RPG where you play gods of uh, mundane things. So you could be like the, the the god of the mall security, or you could be the god of always finding a quarter in your pocket. Or I, I don't know, people have come up with really interesting ones. So that that's cool to see a new expansion for that. Um, there was this huge hardcover OSR book that looked as thick as Dungeon Crawl Classics called The Maze. That I gotta say looked really neat, and supposedly it was a uh, drop it into your favorite world's most popular game, uh, but OSR version, old version, right? Uh, this looked really neat, great artwork and so on. Um, Capers caught my eye as something I didn't hadn't personally heard about, uh, mainly as something I thought Sean would like. This is a 1920 superhero RPG, but you're not playing the supers, you're not playing the cops, you're not playing the feds, you're playing the gangsters. So it's it's not a superhero RPG. It's a super RPG where the gangsters have the powers, which I thought that was a really unique twist. Uh, but the most interesting thing, and what I really wanted to highlight here that I think is important for everyone to know, is that the IGDN up until this point has always been RPGs. 
That's they, they were an RPG publishing company, despite saying Indie Game Developers Network. And if you like went to their booth at Gen Con or Origins, which is where I've seen them, it was some of the best indie RPGs I've ever seen. Like it, it was it was a, it was a one stop shop, and I picked up Worldwide Wrestling there. I've seen Iron Edda there. I, the, the Hydro Hackers they had the um, what's that the ash can there at one time like great stuff i i've spent a lot of money at the id gm booth but it was always rpgs so what they did say is they are branching out so they're broadening their definition of games to include other forms of tabletop uh this includes miniature games and board games now one of the games they did feature that was non-rpg was a game called gangs of the undercity which i i gotta say it kind of reminds me of um what is it called? Necromunda from Warhammer 40k. So I, I don't know how similar they were, but you play street punks in this undercity that's like the 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 depths of the underneath all the, the big city above and gangs battle it out. Now this did look lower tech than the Warhammer 40k game, but did have a similar aesthetic of the, the kind of punk aesthetic and everyone controls their own gang. Uh, the presenters for the show, I'm sorry I didn't catch their names, were very excited by this game like that not even the like not the people from the company but the, the podcasters that were helping or twitch streamers i'm not sure which they were they weren't people i recognized uh were super excited about the gangs of the undercity the big thing here though like the, the fact the igdn is branching out i think is great news like if you publish board games you should get ahead of them this is a company that it's a non-profit that is there to help you get your game developed and published and their entire mission statement is we want to be there for you until you don't need us anymore, which I think is fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, no, Capers, I was aware of uh, due to its Kickstarter. Oh, so it's, it's coming out into real production now. Mm. But uh, I, I, had, I had sort of kept a track of that when, uh, when the Kickstarter was live. And it was interesting, and I kept, I kept leaning towards it and, and looking at it. But I, the real interest for the, the, or the real sort of buzzkill for me is, is the setting. I, mm-hmm. I just don't have enough interest in the, the 20s gangster era to to feel an urge and uh we'll learn another day about how many other super games <laughs> i already have so that was a number of games from the indie game developer network all right next up i have renegade game studios uh the they they had a exceedingly detailed felt long but they're all 50 minutes but, but it's basically a presentation on all the new stuff they have coming and there was a lot of it so this is just uh, the one of the things that stuck out. Actually, a couple I've got. And the one is the Snallygaster Situation, a Kids on Bikes board game. Now, this is obviously based on the very popular Kids on Bikes RPG, which is from Renegade, which is based on Stranger Things. Specifically, that aspect of Kids on Bikes where one of the kids is powered. And that's what makes it stick out from, say, Tales from the Loop and other Kids on Bikes games. In the RPG... All of the players together control the power, and that same thing happens in this board game. Now, unfortunately, that's about all I can tell you. Uh, they didn't really share a lot of info on this. Um, I just, I did kids on bikes. I was a fan of Stranger Things. I never thought that tapping into my 80s nostalgia in a role-playing game would turn out to be something I enjoy. But man, I have. I have enjoyed it way more than I ever thought I would. Uh, despite not really being happy with the way my childhood went, nothing much I can do about it now. But I guess experiencing a better childhood has been worth it. Uh, this looks neat. It looks cool. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more. I, I don't really have enough to, I, I can't sell you on this one because I don't know enough. But it just looked cool. And I love the fact that there is going to be a Kids on the Bikes board game. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, there, there's no, other than the box art, there's nothing yeah. really out there yet. Uh, it's described as a cooperative deduction, hidden movement, team-based game. Mm-hmm. Um, so apparently you need to find the powered and then go and find a cryptid yep. somewhere. Uh, there, A lot of the description feels a lot like horrified. Um, okay. The way they've described it seemed like that just mm-hmm. the first game that came to mind was that. Yeah, I, I I could see that. I got that vibe. So now, now what they did show was the box cover, but then they showed pictures of the cryptids. But all they showed was a picture of the cryptid, and it said like difficulty three stars and difficulty five stars. So that didn't really tell me anything, except that there were multiple cryptids at different difficulty levels. Right. I don't know. I, I want to know more. This one looks good. 
And that was the Snallygaster situation, a kids on bikes board game from Renegade Game Studios. And I will never say those words together in a line again, probably. <laughs> Until we uh, review it. Right. And <laughs> then you'll have to say it. All right. Also from Renegades, uh, they showcase something I think is really cool, something I was actually involved in. Uh, they showcase the new edition of Gravwell. I was a playtester on this new edition of Gravwell. Uh, this is a great update to the classic game that adds a few things. One of them, the ability to play with six players. So the original was four player only, where your four ships are trying to escape the Gravwell. But once you get up to six players, and actually once you have five or six players, some ships are trying to get to the middle and some are trying to get out. And if you've played Gravwell, you know what that means. Like, like Gravwell is all about what ships are closer to try to position and trying to figure out what cards other people remember what cards they drafted so that you go in the direction you want, which is difficult because of the gravity rules. Well, like I said, the difference is now you have ships going the other way, which just kind of makes things so much more interesting. The other thing they did was they added uh, symmetric ship powers. Every ship has four powers now. And they're all unique. So everyone not only has an emergency stop, but you have different asymmetric powers. And while everyone knows who listens to this podcast, watches this show, I love asymmetry. So adding asymmetry to Gravwell is a big win for me. Juicy asymmetry is always fun. And that was Gravwell 2nd Edition, also from Renegade Game Studios. All right, next, I have a really different game doing something totally new in the world of mashing up board games and role-playing games this is keepers of the quest star from upper deck entertainment uh the company that brought you marvel legendary for example this is like a two-player only role-playing game or player versus player dming so each player is running an encounter for the other player and then they have a dm screen in front of them and they have a map behind it and on that map, before they start play, they're going to place monsters, traps, treasure, a starting point, exit, and all these tokens. This is the map the other player is going to be exploring. Now, in general, the goal is to explore the map, starting from the entrance, trying to find the quest star, which is this mythic thing they have came up with for this the setting, and escape. But there are other variations. Uh, the version I saw was just a quest for the quest star. Run in, grab the quest star, and get out. Now, each turn players get action points, kind of like, say, XCOM or something like that, or even Pandemic, where you like you get four points and one point to move a square, another point you can explore a square, so if there's something there, you know whether you're going to encounter it, or if you don't explore, it's just blind, like if you move into a square and run into something, it happens, um, and as they explore, the other player tells them what happens, so it's like, okay, I move left, or I move to E6, and then the other player says, all right, you head down the corridor and you don't see anything. Or you head down the corridor and all of a sudden you find a bub bubbling brook of magic water. What do you do? Right? That kind of thing. Uh, if you run into a monster, monsters are at three different levels. And combat is, is the simplest I think I've ever seen in a role-playing game to keep it flowing. And all this is, is the monsters. Uh, a level one monster has four. And you take these four chits that are number one to four. And then the other player guesses a number from one to four. And if they get the number, they kill the monster. If they don't, they take a damage. And then they do go again. And while if they failed on the first time, now it's out of three, and then it's out of two, and then it's out of one. So you're eventually going to kill the monster. I thought that was kind of a unique combat system. No dice rolls, so people like there's no randomness there. I, it was different. Um, now, there are some story prompts to this game, but it's actually meant to be an improv RPG experience. You're meant to be storytelling. So when you're building that dungeon in front of you, you're actually supposed to be coming up with a story of what's going on. So, for example, the monsters literally say level one, two, and three. It doesn't tell you what they are. But, like, when you're playing, you can be like, well, my level ones are monsters, and my level twos are, are orcs, and my level threes are ogres. And the, the building you're going in is an abandoned keep, and these monsters have moved in because they can feel the power of the quest star or something. Now, they do give some prompts for people who aren't used to full improv, but this is definitely seems like something that's designed for people who know what role-playing is, right? This is To me, this seems like the game. You play on RPG night when the other players cancel and there's only two of you left. So you're like, well, let's play some Quest Star because we can't play D&D &D tonight. I, I thought this was really neat. The other thing I really liked was the aesthetic. This has a very Thundar the Barbarian, early He-Man, early cartoon fantasy look to it that I, I thought was cool. Even the name Quest Star just kind of feels 
that uh, that that oh, what was it? Black Star, you know, all of the, all those early '80s cartoons. Chris Star. Chris Star. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, and it looks like it's very competitive. Like it's really, uh, you know, you're you're both trying to escape your own dungeon, but you're trying to make sure the other guy doesn't. Yes. Uh, is the, is the feel I was really getting out of it. Yeah, the one thing that that you may not have realized by that description, I might have I might have glossed over, is that you're actually playing like two different games at once, right? Like your two adventuring groups aren't ever gonna you're not in the same dungeon. It's it's two concurrent role playing games being run at once, right? You, you, they don't interact. I'm running a dungeon for you, and you're running a dungeon for me, and it just happens to be at the same time. So which I th- I thought just I don't know it's different, right? Like I've never seen anything quite like this. It's 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 literally competitive dungeon crawling which i i think is really neat looking and interestingly there is no board game geek page for this i swear i was on it i i I, I can find an amazon page for it but not a board game geek page i've been i've been punching in a whole lot of search terms trying to find it so all right maybe it's not this one i don't think is out yet like this this was coming soon yeah no it's not it's it's listed there but it's not actually available yet on uh yeah, I Amazon. saw it on Amazon, and it was like some third-party seller who, like, probably instantly made a listing as soon as the game was announced. Yeah, the, yeah, the, like Upper Deck has a, a a page for it now, but it's not available. It's just yeah. Uh, and that was Keepers of the Quest Star from Upper Deck. All right, next up is a company I've never heard of before, Korea Board Games. They showcased a couple of games, and uh, basically kids lighter games. But do, both doing something kind of cool. The the first was Monster Dentist. This this is definitely a kids game. It's like a little kids game. You put the the game between the players, and it's two sided with two monster heads with wide open mouths. And between these, you stack the cards, which show a number of teeth in different colors, some of which have cavities. So just because it's a red tooth, it, it, it'd be a red tooth that's healthier, a red tooth with cavities, for example. Now all these cards are placed face down. You can't see them. Now, while playing, the players are going to look into the mouths of the monsters and insert a dentist mirror, right? Like the kind the dentists use with a little tiny mirror on it and put it kind of like in and under the box is the way it works. And what it lets you do is see the bottom of that stack of cards. And now these are small mirrors, so you don't get to see much and there's not a lot of wiggle room. So it's not like you can really zoom out. You can only really see one or part of a tooth at once. And you're going to kind of use your mirror to figure out what color teeth the monster have and how many of them have cavities. And you're going to mark that with this like board in front of you showing which teeth are where and which are cavities. And the first player to, to get all the guesses ready, just goes stop or whatever. We're ready. And maybe there's a specific term you're supposed to say. And then you're going to pull the bottom card off the deck and see if you're right. Now, if you're right, you get to keep the card, and the first player of the three cards wins. But if you're wrong, you not only don't get the card you just should have won, you lose one you've previously won. And the whole game is played to first of three. Like, dead simple, but neat. Like, I, I've never seen anything that quote uses mirrors this way. And specifically, the having a stack of cards face down and using a mirror to see the bottom card just seems like something that could be used in some kind of heavier game, like something with multi-use cards or something like, like you know how Bruges, you can see the top two colors of the cards, but like some way to put a mirror under the Bruges deck to see the bottom <laughs> card. I, I just seems like you could do more with this. Yeah, it's an interesting mechanic with the use of mirrors. Absolutely. I'm just not sold it would get a lot of replay value yeah. from, from the kids I know. Uh, and a quick look at uh, koreaboardgames.com indicates they have this strange selection of uh games that probably all have some interesting concepts but aren't necessarily fully rounded out uh so then they, they, they've even got like some sub- taking submissions is a big part of their website oh, so okay. i think they're 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 sort they're of looking a um, for new stuff yeah they're, they're really kind of a, a sort of a, a grinder engine to get more games out there which is a okay. good thing but they some of these may be a little underdeveloped okay yeah, as as for um, Monster Dentist, I agree. I I don't know how much fun this would be. Like, yeah, the first couple rounds, I'm sure, are a laugh. Like, I'm sure it's a lot of fun. I also think this would probably be a good one at 3 a.m. and Extra Life when you're a little punch drunk or with adult beverages who are drunk the other way. I Personally, I, I just wanted to bring this up because I think the mechanics need. Like, like, I love that mirror to look at a bottom of a deck thing. I just, I want to do, I'm not even a game designer. I have no aspirations to be a game designer, but that makes me want to do something with that. Yeah. And I think, you know what? I think 
Korea uh, board games might have a, a bunch of little nifty things like that hidden yeah. away in some what might otherwise be less than fantastic games. But that was Monster Dentist from Korea Board Games. All right, the other Korea Board Games game I want to showcase is the Showdown Tactics. So players have a set of Mahjong-style tiles, numbered one to nine, even numbers in one color and odd numbers in the other. Then there's this electronic thing you put between the two players that has a bunch of slots on it. And there's like a central slot on each side, one for each player. And then there's a bunch of places to put the other tiles as you play through. And what you do here is it randomly determines a winner, uh, a leader, and you're going to put one of your tiles face down on your side. And then your opponent's going to put one of their tiles face down on the other. And then what the machine does is figures out which is the higher number out of, out of nine, right? One to nine. And it's going to tell you who won. And then you're going to put them up on the top of this plastic thing. And it shows like an LED showing who won that round. And you're going to keep doing this until you played nine rounds or someone has gotten five wins because it's a best of best of five or best five out of nine. Now, there is one other twist to this. There's also the strategic rule, right, where a one beats a nine. So there's that to it. And what I liked about this is this is a game that wouldn't work without the technology. You couldn't play this, right? Because if you were just playing cards face up, I could card count. I know what you have left. You played a four. I played a five. I beat you by one. I know you no longer have a four. Well, you're playing this. If I play a four and I win, I know you played a one, two, or three. But I don't know if you played a one or a two or a three. And that just leads to some interesting brain space to me. And what this really reminded me of is it's basically war, right? It's who played the higher card. But there was an 80s game that my dad had, and this is one of my favorite games going up, called Electronic General. And what it was, was basically, and I, I don't even know if there was a licensing issues here, but it was a knockoff of Stratego, where you have your numbered pieces on one side, and you had your general, and you had bombs and assassins, and you were playing this area control game. But what happened was when you attack someone else, it worked just like this showdown tactics. You put your piece on your side of the board and your opponent puts their piece on that side of the board and it plays this little music and then tells you who wins. So you had that whole fog of war. So it was Stratego with a fog of war, which I thought was fantastic. Like Stratego always has a fog of war, but when you attack someone, you, they have to reveal. So again, you never know was the thing that beat you higher or was it a bomb or whatever. And that's what the showdown tactics reminded me of a lot. And so I think some of this for me is nostalgia that I really loved Electronic General and though this would be a simplified version. I think it's neat. The one thing I did ask that they could not answer is if you could turn off the battle music. Because I got to admit, even just watching them play three games in a row, I was a little tired of the fact you put your things up and you had to wait for a bit while play some funky music to tell you one. Yeah, well, and again, that's that's sort of what I I kind of expect from this company. <laughs> again, a really interesting concept. It's a it's a it's an interesting gimmick, but have they really done the best things with it? Maybe, yeah. maybe not. I could see grabbing this as uh, as a, a Christmas gift for someone young, uh, you know, as a way yeah. to, to fun way to play war and, you know, think about stuff. So to be honest, you know what? I wish they'd just re-released Electron General. Like, make make this the battle system in something bigger. Well, there is a digital Stratego, so. Oh, maybe that is a version. I, I haven't kept up on that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but that was Showdown Tactics from Korea Board Games. All right. This is taking longer than I thought it was, so I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Next up, I have a game from Goliath. Um, this is called Rule the Realm. This is a, a really unique looking game. So it's a big plastic pegboard with all like pegs, probably the wrong, the pegs are poking up. It's not something you peg things into. And then you open up a map that's on a spiral and you put it over top and you get this like fantasy map and then players somehow use elastics to claim sections of the board. And it's, a, it's an area majority thing. Now, again, there was no information about this. Other than that, they really did not. And this, unfortunately, Goliath wasn't really interacting with the chat much. So I couldn't really tell how to play. But I love the idea of using elastics and different, like the shapes you can make were really cool to play some kind of area control game. It just looked really neat. Now, what I did learn is I was like, hey, this is an onboard game geek. And that is something they did reply to. And they said, oh, when we first announced it, it was called Kachuk. So this is a localization by Goliath of Kachuk, renamed to rule the realm, probably because what's Kachuk? Yeah, it's interesting. So Kachuk is actually 
the Russian version of the original game, uh, Kachuk was actually released in English as Elastium. See, I didn't even see that one. And Goliath appears to be a, a possibly new maps to go on okay. the board to change. Because the Elastium there was Kachuk, definitely a book. Yeah, Elastium Kachuk was more uh, abstract. Um, and from what I could see of the playing, uh, it was both area uh, control. So you were not only trying to take areas inside your elastics, but also using elastics even just between two pegs to block someone else okay, from yeah, yeah. expanding that way. And so there's some interesting gameplay. I think the uses of elastics a lot makes that, um, gives you some interesting options yeah. to do that way. But uh, I I checked out the reviews of Kachuk on Board Game uh, Geek, and initially it looked really good. They've got us. It's a seven five, uh, which is a solid solid review. Yeah. That's... And then I scrolled through them, and there are a lot of tens from before it was released. Oh. So I'm not really trusting the actual. And then reading through the people who took the time to review, again, it's interesting. The uh, there there are some interesting gameplay mechanics available through the use of the elastics, but one, it's only really interesting, and two, elastics dry out. And yeah, you can buy oh, more, yeah. but you got to get ones that are the right size, and you got to yeah. so. There's some there's some pluses and minuses to it. It would probably be really nice to look at on a demo night and get mm. some interest. It's got some table presence. There's definitely that. Yeah, see, the, the the thing that scared me the most about this game, to be honest, is the fact that Goliath put it out. Now, I'm not trying to belittle Goliath, but they are not known for their heavy strategy games. This is the company that brings you the 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 toy based games, the toy horrific games, like Greedy Granny and and the Lost. Uh, sh there's one about a couch, and then the Shark Bite, where you're trying to pull things out of a shark's mouth before it closes. They actually publish a version of the 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 fishing game where the little fish pop up and their mouths open and close. It's just not a strategy game company, right? right. Though they do publish Rummy Cub. So I don't know. I, it, who knows? To they, be honest, they do have like, a lot of um, game show licenses uh, in, in certain okay. countries. So the, uh, I know that like the, in the UK, a lot of the game shows that are on BBC and, and ITV, they Goliath have licenses does. too. All right. But just in general, like you all know, I generally prefer heavier games. I'm not much of a party game fan. So I don't know. Just looking at this, it's just that idea of using elastics for area control. I hadn't even thought about the fact of drying out. I don't doubt the game's interesting enough for, to play for long enough for them to dry out. But it might be one of those you put it on yourself and then pull it out a couple years later and want to play and it doesn't work. I just, I, I like the idea of using elastics for some kind of area of control, zone control and blocking. That just sounds neat. Uh, this one, I want, I want, I'm, I need a review. I, I want to see someone else review this. I I don't even know if it would fit us or not. So I'm, I'd be kind of scared to reach out myself, <laughs> but I'm sure other reviews will be coming out once this is actually published, this new version. I'm, I, I want to see if there's a real game here. And that was Rule the Realm from Goliath. All right. Pandasaurus Games showcased a lot of stuff. Uh, they're really excited about Dinosaur World, which is a follow-up to um, their original Jurassic Park game. Uh, but what I want to talk about is something totally different, which is a game called Brew. And I got to say, immediately as a beer connoisseur, I was like, oh, a brewing game. That should be cool. And I looked it up and I'm like, this has nothing to do with alcohol. And then here's all these like cute fantasy creatures, actually really cool looking fantasy creatures. Kind of reminds me of like wildlings. And there's like, there's all this like trees around this cool looking fox thing. And um, what what is this? So it ends up, this is a fantasy game where you play characters stuck in a fantasy world where the timeline's been messed up and all the seasons are happening at once. And where brew comes in is that you are brewing potions using the seasons and the four elements. So you might have to go get whatever a winter element, there's no element and a fire element to combine them. Uh, this is a dice based worker placement game. Um, I, I don't know a lot about it. There wasn't a lot of information here, but it just looked, really cool the the artwork was fantastic i really like the look of this game uh dice based worker placement sounds good to me i have enjoyed a lot of dice based worker placements like alien frontiers and i'm going to draw a blank and you tales uh euphoria build a better dystopia are some examples or the um the valeria dice game that i can't remember the name of we did a preview of 
I totally forget what that one's called. But the, the newest Valeria game when it comes out is a dice based worker placer. So I, I like that mechanic. Just look great. Yeah, no, absolutely. The dice look fantastic. Uh, but my concern is, and just again, I, we haven't played the game yet. This is just from the images available from the company. Mm -hmm. It looks very busy. There are five different kinds of dice, eight different kinds of tokens, plus cards, plus boards. But now, with all that stuff, it all looks fantastic. Yeah. The art on this and the work on the dice and everything are really fantastic. Uh, but there's a lot of bits. <laughs> yeah, you know what, though? That, that kind of fits what I think back to Dinosaur Island. Like, remember when the first time I laid that out on the table? That's I was like, true. Oh, that's true. Right? Dinosaur Island is a hog. Right? So that doesn't surprise me from Pandasaurus, nor does it scare me, because Dinosaur Island is a surprisingly simple game once you start playing, but it requires a lot of stuff. So the Valeria game I was trying to think of is Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Thank you, Red Meeple Ryan in the chat room. Yes, I should remember that. I'm <laughs> That was actually a really good game. Check out my review on the blog. Preview on the blog. But this game copy. was Brew from Pandasaurus. <laughs> I'm amused by our chat room. Our chat room thinks we're playing good cop, bad cop. No, it's totally unintentional. Though it's probably better than our usual we agree on everything type Fair of enough. content we normally <laughs> have. Yeah, let us know, actually. Uh, this is our first time really doing a show quite with this format, so... Mo's excited about stuff, uh, Sean Kerr, I, I <laughs> guess, is the format. <laughs> uh, next up, I do have another Pandasaurus game. Uh, this is a game called The Loop, which immediately made me think Tales of the Loop and brand ambiguity, which drives me nuts. But this is The Loop, which has nothing to do with Tales from the Loop or The Loop in Tales from the Loop. This is a cooperative time travel based game, which could have happened because of The Loop but never mind. You are trying to stop a mad scientist from destroying the timeline. It's a cooperative game. Uh, one of the things about this is a very cool toy horrific piece that's this thing in the middle that looks like some sci-fi machine that's a dice tower, and you're going to drop the dice into it, and they're going to come out, but they're, the way it's designed is it only comes out onto three spots, like three spots. It's got this like hexagonal board. Well, it's not a hex because there's seven sides. So you have this seven-sided board. And while well, when you drop the dice in, it only come out on possibly three of those. You never know which of the three. And one of the actions you can do is turn this machine. And what these dice represent is what the villain's doing and then what part of the timeline they're, they're so, affecting. So just to be clear, they aren't actually dice. They're just little mini cubes. Oh, I thought they were dice. Okay, nope, just see, cubes. that's that's what happens when all I see is a static image on a screen. All right, so <laughs> cubes come out. And what whatever these cubes represent is, is the bad guy doing something and where they're doing it. Now, on the player side, this is like that part, it's neat. The player side is a tableau building program movement game. You are building a time loop that you are going to repeat over and over. This is your time loop of actions and every time cycle, you're going to do the same action. And you can run that loop any number of times. You can just keep running your loop over and over and over and possibly win the game with the perfectly designed loop. Or you can break it and make a brand new time loop of actions that you can run over and over. That just sounded really neat. Like it reminds me a bit of Mechs versus Minions, which is a program movement game that is very different from Robo Rally in the fact that you program the slots and they stay there every round. So again, you're kind of making like a growing tableau. But this sounds like way more detailed. Whereas Mechs versus Minions is like you move, you shoot, or you turn. And when you move, you get to pick where. And when you turn, you get to pick your direction. This seems a little like these aren't move, it's it's not logo, right? You're not programming a miniature to move on the board. It's programming your actions. Now, I don't know exactly what these actions are. Again, preview at a Gen Con on a live stream, but just sounds cool. Uh, like I, By the end, I'm like, okay, the Dice Tower thing's neat, but I really love the idea of building a time and running an engine. Like That's pure engine building. And you run your until it doesn't work anymore, and then you build a new engine. That sounds fascinating to me. No, absolutely. And I think, again, the art on this one is very distinctive and very interesting. Uh, what's really fun for me, I, me as a as a language geek, uh, Pandasaurus in the North American version has gone with the villain being named Dr. Faux, F-A-U-X, the French Faux, to play, as a playoff of Faux. Uh, yeah. In the original version, the doctor, it's actually Dr. Fu which is a play off of the French F-O-U for crazy. 
So they're, they're, they're playing with their puns. Uh, I, I do have to say, though, in some regions of the U.S., Dr. Faux, F-A-U-X, will never be pronounced that way. Nope, that's <laughs> totally true. Though I do appreciate that they moved away from the calling the doctor crazy. That's not really the best term to use nowadays, and most of us have learned that by now. Yeah. So I am glad that they did switch it. And that was The Loop from Pandasaurus Games. All right, we're at the end. Last one. Last one for the night from the Gen Con Spring Showcase. And this was Monstrosity. Now, I don't think this is a new game. I have no idea. This was literally the last event of the show before the wrap-up where they got six popular streamers together to play this game together. Now, to be honest, until seeing the game played, I didn't care about this game. I knew it existed. I knew it was yet another draw thing. I didn't know if it was draw a bit, pass it on, someone else was drawing it. I knew it was monster-based. I, I have telestrations. I love telestrations. I, I don't need it. And, and, and if I want something a little heavier, I have, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's got a dragon on it. Pictionary is not the word. It begins pick domino, pick, it begins pick. All right, if I remember it, it's a Vlada Shavadol drawing game. Uh, if I can remember the name of that, I'll bring it in. But anyway, I, I'm happy with the drawing games I own. Um, I am curious about that tattoo one. That looked kind of cool as something a little different because it kind of adds in the butt weight. There's more description thing and pitch to it. So I had no clue what this is. But then I watched this. Pictomania. Thank you, Ryan. My brain's just today. So I saw this live stream and I was like, oh, wow, that looked like fun. Like that, I, I could see having fun with my gaming group playing this game. So the way this game works is uh, the, like the clue giver, right? Just like all these games, there's always someone who gives the clue and everyone else is trying to guess, right? So what they do is they draw a card and it's got this picture of a monster on it. And then they have a very short amount of time, like 20 seconds, if I remember correctly, to describe what they see. And everyone else just sits and listens attentively and they try to catch in all the details. Then you start the official round, which is the drawing and question phase. And the players are trying to draw the monster that was just described. But while drawing, they can now ask questions. So it can be like, oh, wait, you said the monster had a human face in the eye, like a whole human face with eyes on the eyes? Okay. And, well, also have like a mouth and nose? Yeah, it has a mouth and nose. And then you hear the other people talking like, oh, I didn't draw mine with a nose. You didn't say it had a nose. You have the thing. Now there's a timer. I don't know how long the timer was, to be honest. It, it ran out at some point. Actually, I remember watching the stream. It was hilarious because we're like, wait, how much time's left on the timer? Like one second. Like, oh, that didn't give us enough time to fix. Because it, it, it was at the very end. It ends up the monster wasn't facing forward, but was walking sideways. So absolutely. Well, actually, it ended up one person did draw it sideways. But most people were drawing this face on a monster. So then once you're done, the players all hold up their monster and here's where every drawing party game falls apart there's some weird system for scoring where the person picks their favorite i always hate those rules like personally i think it should be objective it should be like which one looks the closest to this and maybe everyone votes but no it was just like which one does the person who is describing the monster like the most whatever i haven't read the rules maybe that's maybe that's just how they played it i just gotta say this looked like way more fun than i would have thought like i, I want to play this I, I want this at our next extra life event like it, it'd be a very different vibe than telestrations but still i think a ton of fun now my worry though is i i don't know how many cards there are like i have a feeling you'd eventually learn all the monsters and kind of like once you use one monster with one group it's kind of used up as far as i could see like, I, I don't see how it wouldn't, right? Like, I'd be sitting there, like, after playing our 50th game of Monstrosity going, yeah, I remember the monster with a face for an eye, draw that one, right? Like, I, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, it is newish. It's 2020. I don't know the exact uh, okay. when in 2020 it came out. Um, <laughs> Eric Lang says, imagine if Telestrations featured your most hilariously horrifying Freudian nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh so I and now to address your your concern about cards, they've already put out an expansion. All right, cute creatures. So they are looking to support it, and it's forty cards Ooh, uh, extra slow. on the on the expansion. So okay. I don't know. I, I actually don't know how many there are in the box. I can't find that number. But for ten bucks, you get forty more monsters. Okay, which isn't too bad. Uh, and yeah, it also I don't know the price point. I'm, I'm assuming this board. is. Assuming this is a very low player or uh, cost game, at twenty five bucks US. Okay, so so now when these people played, they didn't have player boards. They were playing over Zoom, 
So right. that is something else. Here's a huge bonus for this game. There's a game you can play over Zoom. Absolutely. Which, like, like, and they were drawing, like one person had literal line paper. Someone else had an art pad. Someone else just had a giant whiteboard they were drawing on. I draw it on I screen. don't know if the game <laughs> comes with. It does, yes. Oh, okay. Yep, it comes with. There's, so there's that a, justifies there's the a big score. There's a big scoring chart that you can like keep score on for everybody. Sort of like a, like a movie movie board sort of thing. Okay. Everyone has right on, wipe off, uh, pages all right so that, that so, yeah. more justifies the price i'm thinking it was that price for just a deck of cards and no I'm like, no eh. no no this is a box this yeah is a, so this was this box. was just because they were playing it over zoom yeah uh, i want to so, play this over zoom like like <laughs> the only problem is almost everyone needs a copy or i guess i could like close my eye and hold it up and tell everyone to close their eyes until <laughs> i don't know uh, I, it, you know what it's it's a fun party game but their demo images look better than anything I've ever drawn in my oh, yeah, life. Of course. I, I, th that's all that always bothers. Like, why not show some real art that people actually draw <laughs> in the game with like, you know, stick figures that don't even look like stick figures. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I can't help you with that one, yeah. but that you know was... what? Pictomania. Pictomania is, it's a mass market game. Like shows this dad drawing like a lasso and it's like a loop with a line. So it's out there, but I guess yeah. all the hobby gamers are like, actual artists <laughs> well that was mondrosity and it's available from either bread and circuses or deep water games depending on what region you're in now that's our coverage for the gen con spring showcase we're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has questions